Good afternoon, Alex Woods here, civil litigator and owner of Redwood Legal, law firm based in London in the United Kingdom. Now, I'm starting to do this series of vlogs on the small claims courts, um, partly because the small claims limit has risen from 5,000 to 10,000, and now there's just a much greater quantity of claims being passed through the courts, and also partly, to be perfectly frank, to generate some business, to generate a client base in return for doing these free advice vlogs on all the sort of intricacies of details, the technical areas, but also uh, being crystal clear about how it is that you need to go about bringing your small claim through the courts in the United Kingdom, in England and Wales. And I want to do it whilst actually referring to live cases. These are cases that we're running in the, in the law firm and we're running with the permission and that we're broadcasting with the permission of our clients. So that's like the general aim of these vlogs. Um, and this is the very first in that series. Now there's no particular order of them, but you'll be able to search quite easily through the video library on the site uh, for the vlog that hopefully addresses your individual concern. So, without further ado, I will come on to, well, I will just say very quickly that, as you may or may not know, but the small claims court system in England and Wales is set up specifically to help those people who do not want to use a lawyer. I mean, the idea of it is it's a lawyer-free zone. So, that obviously keeps costs down. Now, that throws up various issues, which I'll come on to. So in, today I'm going to talk about a defence and a counterclaim, and if you're a claimant, how to respond to a defence and a counterclaim. So this isn't what is often the typical bread and butter of the small, small claims court in an unpaid debt, or somebody hasn't completed the work and done a runner. They're pretty typical cases for the small claims court, and probably best dealt with by means of a statutory demand. But this is actually where your opponent has, if you like, punched back, and in this case, punched back not just with a defence, but with a counterclaim. That means that they are not only saying you are wrong about your claim, but furthermore, we're bringing our own claim against you. How do you deal with that? Okay, so to come on to the specifics of this particular case that we're running, and here is just to let you know the scale of the paperwork. And I have an email from the client here. I then have, uh, and don't forget, you know, civil litigation is all about paperwork. It's all about getting your paperwork in Apple Pie order. Um, and there I have the claim form itself. And the client has been, in their view, uh, deprived of a total of three invoices, barely a thousand pound value. And she's simply saying, to a interior designer, our client is a curtain manufacturer, a, a curtain maker. She is saying uh, to the interior designer, why haven't you paid these three invoices to cough up? I produced these curtains to order. So that's how the claim started. But then subsequently, her opponent, much to her surprise, not only did she uh, defend the claims and say that these invoices are uh, that, that the money isn't owed on account of set-off, but she also claimed against our client for damages that she was caused by what she says is the inadequate craftsmanship. The, um, the, basically, she failed to deliver um, these curtains, and the, the, the detail of this case is that the curtains that were ordered were without interlining. So that means, I guess, I'm no specialist, they were a little bit more flimsier than your average curtain. Nevertheless, according to my client, that's what the interior designer specifically requested. That was, you know, that was what was on the order. I don't need these curtains interlined. Okay, so to her surprise, not only has she said that this is all wrong and the curtains are poorly made, which is the defence to the claim. She's also said that she's been put to some uh, expense, some difficulty, or some considerable expense and difficulty, in fact, as a result of having to remedy the problem, having to deal with the damage caused by my client. 
Now, this is quite an interesting case in a way because the, what's happened here is you've got an interior designer who's got their client uh, who's placed an order, and I dare say that the interior designer has oversold uh, and undercosted what can be delivered for what price, and the you know the client has uh, said, "Fine, I don't need these curtains, or I don't want these curtains into line. The detail's not important." Um, and she's then placed this order for uh, curtains that weren't in, interline. Uh, so it's probably a case of the interior designer wanting to put the cost of having to remedy the mistake, the, ups, the oversale that they made to their client, place that cost on my client's shoulders. So now, <laughs> the claim form, as I've just shown you, is one page. So when my client brought this case, he was just looking for the payment of invoices for this work. The paperwork that she's now confronted with, and it's sort of been taken by surprise, if you like, is somewhat more substantial. There is defence, there's a counterclaim. We're now talking at a, a value of 1,300 for the counterclaim to remedy the damage that was caused. And more importantly, here is one, two, you know, two pages of, of detailed uh, evidence, you could call it, detailed uh, of detail in, in which she explains how it is that my client didn't do a good job and then she'd have to pick up the tab for the cost of remedying the breach. So uh, now those are the facts. Now the issue and the problem uh, and what happened with my client is that she then uh, produced her own response to that long document, an even longer document, one, two, it's actually five pages in length, a detailed story about why the defendant, the interior designer, is wrong. She was about to file that with the court before she spoke to me. And what the problem here is that she has not separated out the issues from the evidence. Now, if you take nothing more from this video, just take this one simple message. When you are dealing with a claim, when you're dealing with a defence, when you are dealing with a counterclaim, when you are dealing with a reply to a defence and a counterclaim and a defence to a counterclaim, be crystal clear and be separating out the issues. Because at this stage of proceedings, that's what the court is interested in. They're not interested in the evidence, they're not interested in an indignant and outraged claimant who says that uh, the defendant is cooked up a cock and bull story just to apply pressure on our claimant. Uh, they're not interested in that is evidence and that will come at a later stage. I'll come on to that. Right now you need to be lean, mean and clear and crystal clear about the issues. So to uh, apply the principle, uh, but this isn't, uh, this isn't, this is difficult because uh, the law expects you to, uh, the courts, you know, expect you to know the law. You're expected, ignorance of the law is no defence. So you're expected to, the technical term is plead your reply uh, to the defence and your defence to uh, your opponent's counterclaim um, in accordance with the law. So, you know, strictly speaking, even though it's a small claims court, the same law still applies. So you've got to go through a particular gateway. It may be a contract, and in this case there is a clear contract, but, you know, in a case where there wasn't a contract, you know, where someone drove a truck through your garden fence or did some works that caused damage to your azalea patch in your back garden, whatever it might be, uh, that would be a negligence claim, and that that would be a different gateway to the courts, and you would have to be, deal with different issues. This arose at different sort of threshold, different hurdles you would have to overcome. Now, this is something of a problem. Um, and it, it occurred to me this morning as I was preparing this video. You've got a consumer who's got a, you know a genuine grievance, and you've got a system that's meant to be free of lawyers, uh, and yet you need some understanding and grasp of the law. Now the judge is going to be sympathetic. The idea of the small claim system is it's not, you know, procedure heavy. It's relaxed about compliance with the civil procedure rules. But nevertheless, ultimately you will need to uh, convince the judge that you have the law on your side. Now don't worry too much. Don't rush off to read your books of contracts, negligence, etc. 
the, the, it comes back to the main thing, be crystal clear. So to apply this to the individual facts of this case, what uh, my client needs to do is respond to the defence. The defence is that she supplied poor or the wrong workmanship in terms of the construction of these curtains and the issue of these inner linings or underlinings. Uh, my client is saying, no, I made what you asked me to make. The specification that you gave me, I delivered on. It's your problem that that specification made your end client unhappy. All right? So that's all that needs to go in the reply to the defence. Uh, the defendant is wrong. Uh, I supply the curtains to the specification that the defendant gave me. You might want to go on to say, explain that uh, the end client perhaps had a different idea of what that specification was. You might want to say that too. So that's the first paragraph. You've replied to the defence. And look, you don't need to write a five-page document. A judge is going to get a headache reading that, and I'll come on to another reason in a bit whilst that is not a good idea. Now, separate out the issues. That's crystal clear. That's what you say about her defence. It's not poor workmanship, it's what was requested, what was, what, was, what was ordered. So then the second part is the counterclaim. Now, the defendant here, the interior designer, is saying, oh, it was a disaster, these curtains were dreadful, they caused me incredible pain and embarrassment and financial loss with this client because I had to make a new set of curtains and I didn't trust you, the claimant, so I had to use someone else and I was in a hurry to deliver on this order and they were very expensive and here's the bill, thank you very much, for £1,500. So, now the first thing to note is that the claimant in this case has an expectation that the defendant will do what they can to mitigate their loss. Now that's a technical term, but it's a common sense thing. Why didn't, in this case, the defendant come back to the claimant and say, look, the curtains are unsatisfactory, uh, can you remedy the breach of the contract to provide the right curtains? Uh, now that opportunity May, I won't go into too much detail of this case because you know, there's some confidential issues here in, in, that, that, are, that are involved. But that, uh, uh, that issue you know, may or may not have been uh, addressed by the defendant. And if they've gone on and just spent a lot of money on another um, curtain designer in a hurry and not given our client the opportunity to remedy the breach, that is an issue that the, that the court will take, will take keen note of. So, uh, you know, so that would therefore, you'd have a second paragraph in your defence to the counterclaim saying, uh, I was never given, I was not told about the problem and I was not given the opportunity to remedy it. You would say also, um, whilst I completely refute and reject the counterclaim because I say that I did deliver on the contract and supply the curtains as they were specified, uh, you then go on to say that, however, in the event that the court does not find for me on my uh, reply to their defence, I nevertheless say that all these costs were incurred by the defendant without having given me the opportunity to, to remedy the breach myself. So that would be a second paragraph. And there you have it, a reply and um, a defence to... Um, reply in defence to a counterclaim. So I'll just come on to, to say why this is of interest to, to a court. When ultimately you get to trial, you'll be faced with a judge who will want to have, who will be busy, and he will not want to have to wade through a lot of paperwork unnecessarily. He will want to get to the issue straight away. And the issue in this case is, were the curtains that were supplied to the defendant the curtains that were ordered? Did they meet that initial specification, issue number one? You also want to be concentrating on, well, did the defendant give the claimant an opportunity to remedy the breach? This, this, this uh, large amount of money, it's £1,500 for apparently making a new set of curtains or repairing a set of curtains, 
um, you know, is it really fair? So, um, so that's, that's how the judge will look at it. And we would be grateful to you if, in your reply and defence to the counterclaim, at a relatively early stage of proceedings, you've laid this out clearly. Now, obviously, you have a beef about an, uh, your defendant and you think that they've cooked up this defence and this counterclaim just to palm you off. And they may be a bigger company, a bigger corporation who can think that they can steamroll over you. Um, and so you will want to submit your evidence, but the point is you submit that at a later stage. So after you've dealt with what's called the pleadings, the claim, and then the defence, and then if there's a counterclaim, that as well, and then a reply and a defence to counterclaim. Those are the pleadings. When it gets close to the trial date, the court will then send some directions to both parties saying, you now have to, within, let's say, 14 days before trial, 28 days before trial, exchange witness statements and exchange any disclosure, any documentation upon which you propose to rely at the hearing. That's the stage when you can get out all your uh, evidence um, on you know, why it is the defendant has got it wrong. Um, and, and here, just to, to illustrate, in this case, the defendant actually continued to use the claimant's curtains in their display showroom. So they were clearly happy with the claimant's work in general. Um, why were they accusing her of poor workmanship, poor workmanship in respect of this one particular case? Now that's kind of not strictly relevant, but it is important evidence, but it is evidence. So you want to be putting that into a witness statement down the track and not into your pleadings at the beginning. So there it is. I think we'll we'll wrap up the the vlog for there. I'll just have a quick look at my notes here if there's anything else that I've missed. Um, no, I think that's it. When you're doing this document in response, you can call it a reply and defence to the counterclaim. Make sure, you know, you just break out into separate paragraphs these separate issues. Okay, well thank you very much for listening this afternoon. There is some text below to help you, a uh, brief headline text below. Of course, I'm open for business, so if you do need, you know, phone help at some sort of light, a lawyer light sort of service in terms of support during the course of your of course the proceedings through the small claims track, don't hesitate to give us a call. Goodbye for now.